chaos is necessary, but not sufficient? How do we help the organization understand the good work we're doing? How do we help them understand the risks that exist so they'll prioritize the work to go fix it? How do we help them understand the risks we've mitigated so that they understand that we've done a lot of good work and put us in a much more reliable posture? Hi, this is your host, Aplin Bhartia, and welcome to TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us once again, Colton Andrews, CTO and founder of Gremlin. Colton, it's great to have you on the show. My pleasure to be here again. Thank you. Of course, we have, folks have been hosting you for a long time, so our audience, they do know uh, very well about Gremlin, but it's uh, always a good idea to refresh memories. and Tell us, you know, what do you folks do? Because the fact is the world is changing so rapidly that with every new product, every new service, you know, the focus, uh, the, it, it also changes the companies, they evolve over time. So, so talk about Gremlin. And we're no, we're no different. We have to change and evolve and adapt. And, you know, that's part of the joy of software engineering. You get to learn and you get to improve. So, yeah, Gremlin is focused on helping engineers build reliable systems. And we originally began by building the best chaos engineering tool available, focused on safety, on security, on making sure everyone had the tools to go recreate outages, to go find failures and fix them before they cause problems. And over the last year, we really expanded that to be more of a reliability platform. So helping people to now score tests, to measure risk within their systems, to track the good work their teams are doing so that we're not only talking about the outages, but we're also talking about all the good risks we've mitigated along the way. I also want to talk a bit about, uh, of course, we'll be running a dedicated show next month, which will be about uh, site reliability, SREs. But since some of the... The discussion that we are going to have today are going to touch on these topics. So I do want to uh, ask you quickly that if you look at the whole reliability, uh, depending on who we talk to, marketing teams, tech teams, you know, everybody defines it differently. It means different things to them. And none of those definitions are wrong. When I ask you, how would you define or beyond defining that what does it really mean for teams when we talk about reliability? I mean, I came from, I really got steeped in reliability at Amazon. And, you know, what we cared about was customer focus. And, and is the customer doing well? And then I saw this again at Netflix. Are we winning moments of truth with customers? And so to me, reliability is, does the platform, does the service, does the product work when the customer need it, needs it to work? Does it work well? That's what really matters. Everything else is details to support that goal. Whose job is it uh, to ensure reliability? Or when we look at SREs or reliability, there are either superset, subsets, overlaps, gaps. That's one of the problems we have with reliability is truthfully, reliability is many people's problems. We all take a role. We need the platform team to do the right things. We need our cloud provider to do the right things. We need our code to handle you know, failure modes and how it interacts with dependencies well. And we need to be able to monitor that and understand when it's degrading and take action. And that's one of the things that makes this space hard is because it's owned by everyone, it's owned by no one. And therefore, you know, who, you know, who can really champion the whole organization to go fix this? Who can really, you know, set the standard that, you know, the customer experience is sacred here and we really have to invest in ensuring that we meet those expectations becomes a, a very high level CTO level, CEO level mandate because we have to get the whole company working together, certainly the whole engineering and technical organization. As you said, if it is everybody's problem, it's nobody's problem. Uh, when you look at SRE, uh, is it more of a practice, process, culture, or more about tools and products? Yeah, I think, you know, the SREs have a tough job. They have to go in and, and help the organization do the right thing. And so sometimes they need to be the experts and tools and they need to go help the organization understand those tools and leverage those tools. Sometimes they need to be the experts in the patterns, circuit breakers, back offs, timeouts, thread pools, how we protect ourselves, how we shed load. And so they act as consultants to go teach teams about these things and make sure they're incorporating them into their designs and into their code. Uh, they're often the people that are getting paged when things are broken. So they have to have the real time, you know, analytics, triage and restoration skills that are required. And I think that's it's a hard job, but that's part of why we're seeing some cracks in SRE. It, we can't ask one team to do all of these things 
And we can't, uh, without giving them kind of full control and full influence, we can't give them purview over the whole application and make them responsible for it. Do you see these practices, processes in place? Of course, tools are not sufficient where you, when you, of course, deal with your customers or clients um, or the, you know, in general uh, industries where you see, hey, you know, most of the companies, they do have practices like chaos engineering, reliability, or, or you feel that, hey, you know what, no, no, we still have to go out and do a lot of education there as well. You know, we're past the point where folks have never heard of it. And so most teams have heard of it. They've dabbled in it. They've done some of it. You know, I've been pressed to see uh, a lot of organizations, you know, really double down and do it well. You know, think about how do we, a, a lot of times what teams do is, and organizations do, because it's a new process, is they ask one team to go do it. And they kind of judge the results on how well it worked for that team. And the downfall of that approach is if that team isn't super important in the line of fire, if they don't find something critical, they might feel like, well, that was a lot of work and, you know, were the results worth it? And, and so that opportunity, how do we help them, you know, take that across the organization to go improve things across the way, but understand and track the, the benefits? I think that's, that's where things get tough is how they've got to they've train, they've got to measure, they've got to teach, and then they've got to, you know, have the right outcomes occur as well. When we do look at things like reliability or chaos engineering, can you look at it from a holistic per perspective where we do look at, of course, moving fast, being secure? You no, know, it's not like they're just doing one specific job for one problem, but it actually it ha have an impact on the whole organization. I think there's a lot of analogies on the security side in particular that we can learn from in the reliability say, space. Security is fighting the defender's dilemma like we are. Many things could go wrong and we really need to protect against as many as possible but they're not all equal, they're not all equally likely. So we have to do a set of risk assessment. We have to decide which ones we think are most impactful. And then we have to go get other teams to do the work like security. And I alluded to this earlier, but how do we get that done? Uh, a lot of the work we've been doing is, you know, chaos engineering is a good means to an end. It's a good way to run some tests and understand how the system behaves. It's not a good way to go influence your organization to go do the right things from a reliability perspective. It often looks like you found a little bug in pre-prod, which is exactly what we set out to do. Find something you know, before it's a problem, before it's a big deal, before it's a huge outage and fix it. But then that means it's hard to take credit for fixing a big outage that never occurred. And so how do we get credit for teams for fixing things that were minor when they fixed them, but could have been you know, a huge event for the company. How do we recognize that? Well, that's, that's one of the problems, the incentive problems that we share with security. If we do our job well, it looks like we've done nothing at all. The software just runs smoothly and boringly. If we don't do our job well, then we look like heroes when we come in as firefighters to fix it. But that's not actually the behavior we want to incentivize. And so this comes to a lot of the deep thought we had, I had personally, chaos is necessary, but not sufficient. How do we help the organization understand the good work we're doing? How do we help them understand the risks that exist so they'll prioritize the work to go fix it? How do we help them understand the risks we've mitigated so that they understand that we've done a lot of good work and put us in a much more reliable posture? And this is again, overlaps with the SRE's plight. How do they get credit for the good work they're doing? How do they show that they've made the system more reliable? And so we fell upon, you know, we need a concept of scores. We need a concept of risks. We need a way to track these reliability efforts. We need a way for teams and for services to show, hey, we've done X, Y, and Z. And so we're, you know, resilient to these types of failures. We've mitigated these risks. And what that enables is the SRE team and the CTO and the other folks to talk about where should we spend our time and effort? on the teams that are doing things that have mitigated most of the issues or on the teams who haven't done things or the teams where a lot of issues arise. And it becomes, you know, we'd rather know about the, the, the cobwebs and the spiders under the bed than be surprised by them. We would rather understand about the failures and, and then be able to do that prioritization and mitigation in a thoughtful engineering approach, as opposed to always reacting and responding to the latest fire that occurs. All these practices, we can talk about cultural changes, but you also have to hand over right tools. Most of these things are about cultural change, but tools also 
play a big role. And we started the interview uh, discussing, you know, how uh, things have evolved. So can you talk about how Gremlin is kind of enabling these teams uh, uh, so that once again, things don't get too overwhelmed for them. So talk about your evolution, the new key capabilities, new features that are, you're adding for your users. Yeah, there's, there's really two things that come to mind. One is the new reliability management product we built is really meant to be the easy button for most teams. So the original Gremlin platform is for the SRE team. It's for the experts. It has every knob and dial and you can do whatever you want. But most teams are daunted and intimidated by that. They're unwilling to go, you know, there's too many knobs and dials. There's too many things. And what if they get it wrong and something ha bad happens? And so we thought about how do we build uh, a very uh, robust but safe test suite out of the box? So what are the five tests every team should run? There's really eight. What are the eight tests every team should run? Let us wire up your monitoring so that we know that if something goes wrong, we can stop it, we can clean it up, and we can make sure we know that your system withstood that test, that it responded correctly. And so that's one piece. Let's help the SRE team by giving each individual engineering team you know, a straightforward set of tests to go run and a score to know whether they've accomplished it or not. But there's another thing, this detected risk that we've just launched is, is even a step further. What if I don't want to run any test? Could you just tell me about risks that exist in my system? And the answer is yes. We already collect a good amount of data, especially about Kubernetes environments, cloud environments. Uh, we have our agents installed. And so there's things that we can detect without ever running a test. So we don't need to go make an invasive change or go cause a failure. We can tell you, hey, we know your, your service isn't deployed redundantly. This is a, you know, day one best practice. Let's get you, you know, to go deploy redundantly. Uh, so that ability to detect these risks before somebody even runs a test, that gives teams the ability to go find and fix, you know, low hanging fruit without, you know, putting themselves at risk. Let's talk about from the from the chaos engine perspective as well, because the whole idea of chaos engine actually is not that chaotic. It's very well structured, very well organized. That's also when you bring the whole organization together instead of uh, teams working in uh, silos. Can you also talk about when it comes to whole approach, whole mindset, whole mentality? You know, in the early days we used to say, hey, don't fix it if it's not broken. But now we actually break things on purpose uh, to 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 make sure that it will not break when it's running in production. It's not as same as like taking the steering wheels while you're driving on the highway. It's, it's chaos engineering is not like that. So, so talk about the, the mindset part, changing how organizations approach it. It's a good analogy. Uh, you know, when we crash test cars, we don't do it on the freeway out, out live where lives are at risk. We do it in a, you know, safe environment. We have a lot of measurements. We're doing things in a way to make sure it behaves the way we expect. And really, a lot of what we're learning in those environments is how does the system behave when things go wrong? We don't get a lot of data from this as engineers on a regular basis. We look at the happy case the majority of the time. And so, so much of what I see within organizations is it's really a learning tool. They think the system behaves in one way and they run some tests and the outcome tells them that their assumptions were incorrect. And they have to spend a moment and go revisit why didn't it behave the way I expect. And very often that uncovers, you know, a, an assumption and then a flaw or a mistake or an issue that could have been fixed as a result. So I think one of the things that we've seen be successful, you know, how do you how do you get an organization to embrace this and see the value and do it efficiently? Because, you know, it's about how we can, you know, invest the right amount of time. We shouldn't be spending all of our time on reliability. We want to go in, be effective, mitigate the issues, and then move on and go back to making customers happy and making our product well. So to me, that's that's one part the, the leadership cares about it. They say that reliability is important and they have measurements around those. They talk about you know outages and outage minutes and their uptime, but they also talk about things like these scores and these risks. How are we tracking what's coming down the pipe? What is our business continuity? What is our disaster recovery? How do we fit compliance? All of these things are really related to understanding mitigating risk in the future. And that's really about understanding it today. The other side is, you know, sharing these stories that the engineering teams do. Uh, that, you know, teams, engineers are busy and we're all skeptical. And so really we need to be convinced that this is a good use of our time and that we're gonna learn something we didn't know and we're gonna be better on the other side. And I think that's the part where 
when teams get up and talk about, hey, I ran, you know, I, I was new to this. I wanted to run some experiments. I was on with a customer a couple of weeks ago and they were sharing this in their company all hands. And they found three critical issues in their first game day, you know, right out the gate. They went in, they thought they were testing some pretty simple things. They found things that would have been, you know, full outages had they occurred. And I think that's the, that's the, you know, that's the social part of it. We're wired to hear stories. We're wired to hear about things that have worked well for others. We want to learn from others. And so we want to know that, hey, if I'm going to be first, uh, you know, can, has someone else come before me? Can I learn from them? And so if somebody else has done it well, great. You know, I'm more willing to go uh, out and try it myself. I have more faith that uh, someone else's story might be like my own in the end. I also want to talk about one thing because this is the hottest topic these days, which is uh, generative AI, Gen AI, you know, chat GPT, all those things. When we look at chaos engineering uh, and a lot of other practices, uh, we have been leveraging some kind of machine learning AI for a very long time. Uh, what role do you see of Gen AI in chaos engineering or, you know, if you look at the whole, uh, your own roadmap? it's a fun time we live in because there's a lot that could happen and you know i'm not really sure how it will play out but uh specifically uh as, as we've watched chaos engineering evolve uh the original instantiation was you you know will provide the tooling you run the tests you determine if the system behaved correctly and you go fix it a lot of work for the end user this next iteration was all right will you know you kick off the test but we will monitor the system health we will tell you whether the test succeeded and then you need to go fix any issue that found well so the natural next step is we'll run the test we'll tell you what went wrong and we'll tell you how to go fix it and i think there are a, a very well known class of problems that we can recommend you know either best practice patterns or specific code changes to go mitigate hey you don't have a circuit breaker around your dependency this is a circuit breaker pattern. This is how you implement it. This is a fallback. This is what you need to know here. Hey, it looks like you're calling a dependency in a tight loop. You should really think about how you could move that network call out of a tight loop. And here's how we know it. We have a lot of interesting data on not just the systems, but how the systems respond under tests. And again, I think that's a very unique perspective. Everyone looks at the happy case, which means that if we have AI run our systems, they'll do great when everything is the happy case and they will fail horribly when things go wrong. And so that opportunity to understand those failure cases, to maybe teach those models about those failure cases, to help them to understand how to respond, I think there's a lot of interesting work there. And I think that, you know, just how we interact with uh, computers is one of the opportunities to change. The natural language processing, you know, uh, I write a developer tool. Uh, it's incredibly precise. Uh, it requires a lot of expertise. If you could, you know, talk to that tool, negotiate with that tool, help it understand what you're trying to accomplish and let it decide upon the details. You know, again, I got a high bar for what success looks like there for my own product, but assuming we could meet that, why wouldn't we? Colton, thank you so much for taking time out today. And of course, talk about the whole evolution of Gremlin. Uh, of course, uh, site reliability, chaos engineering. Thanks for all those great insights. And I would love to talk to you again soon. Thank you. My pleasure. O always enjoy coming and speaking with you. You ask great questions. We have great discussions. So appreciate the time.